Is it possible for a person to wrap invisible fingers around warm hands they will never live long enough to hold? Do they find ways to murmur into younger ears the brilliance they discovered during their brief stopover in time? Can ghosts hitch rides on physical objects that will arrive at a transit station in the future? And even though they can't quite make out their face through the fog, will there be someone to meet them at the platform to receive their suitcase of wisdom? Grace. That was the puzzling word. Forever a compelling word to me. I was acquainted with it in theory, but I found myself staring at its complexities on lots of occasions, like squinting into a murky pool that obscures exotic orange and purple fish in its darkness. It was the single reason I read Flannery's stories while I waited, with little hope of ever understanding the punchline. She was raised Catholic, I knew that. Southern, I knew that too. I wasn't a mere fan. I was a wandering pilgrim, seated on the hillside of her stories, listening intently, gazing up at her in faith as she delivered her sermons on the mount in wise blood and a good man is hard to find. Me? I was a long ago backslidden Southern Baptist, confounded by the preachers who peppered their sermons with the G word, but steeped just long enough in the seduction of its promise to glimpse it and then lose sight of it repeatedly. So terrified was I of my South of the Mason-Dixon line ancestry that the particular flavor and definition of grace I was seeking seemed absurdly out of the question. I love snapshots. The signs I see and the images I capture and the genius of master image makers pushes me like a propeller in my life. I wander where my camera leads me. I trust its talent as a tour guide. A brilliant blue Sunday morning in Savannah, Georgia found me consenting to my camera to, once again, allow it to pull me through and around unfamiliar sights. I photographed the skeleton of a long ago closed down Woolworth store. The salmon stucco of a Caribbean influenced mansion, single stalks of mums leaning in old bottles. Then there it was, the whistle of the train that would be arriving shortly. My heart began to beat out of its regular rhythm. My right eye glued to the viewer of my camera, cropping and inspecting every fold in her gown, every outline on the letters spelling out grace. My left eye remained squeezed shut so I wouldn't have to admit there was more world around me than what I saw through my lens. Finally, looking away from the scene, it became apparent that I was in a square. The L shape on two sides was formed by a Catholic church on which I found perched yet another grace lady. The light triumphed as I dived through my lens again. I wondered, sometime later, when I became conscious there was a body attached to my camera, where I was exactly. I saw a marker lay ahead in front of a house that was undergoing renovation. The words on the marker read, Flannery O'Connor Childhood Home. Mary Flannery O'Connor, novelist and short story writer, born Savannah, 1925. Grew up in this house, and in later years she called it simply the house I was raised in, attending church at the cathedral across Lafayette Square. So it seems impossible, even to me, how it had never registered with me 
that Flannery had lived in Savannah. I'd never looked it up, nor had that particular fact ever taken up residence in my brain. Now when a bold line of this magnitude is drawn between one number and the next on the big connect the dot pages of your life, the sight of it electrifies you. It also applies a sort of otherworldly band-aid over a jagged place in your spirit, followed shortly thereafter by a relief you never knew you needed. In a millisecond, I knew that Flannery had looked out the windows of her house that faced where she went to Mass every day. The walls of the Church of St. John the Baptist perpetually displayed the Ladies of Grace like billboards advertising what was inside. A friendly commercial about the kind of merchandise Flannery could purchase if she kept coming back. Always looking toward her in both the cold wind and the stifling savanna heat. Always beautiful. Always graceful. She confided in them when she taught a chicken how to walk backwards when she was six, and when she knew her father was too sick to ever get well again. Paradoxical grace. Absurd grace. Ridiculous grace. Yes, that is what I knew about her definition directly. That is what she told me every time. Bizarre grace. Harebrained grace. Unhinged grace. Suddenly, I noticed a giant dumpster placed directly in front of the house. It was stuffed with peeled off bits of old walled paper, moldy pine strips of splintered wood, and white window frames spattered with dried sheetrock mud. The girls, looking across the square, pointed in the direction of the trash bin. Take it, they whispered. Is it stealing? Childish grace. Claiming a prize that's otherwise bound for the disposal heap? Bountiful grace. Just in time, he rounds the corner of the church, and gratefully I remember he's taller than I am. Get that window, I think I said to him. That window in the trash, it's for me. It's mine. Gently pulling the gift free of its dumpster coffin, he raises it to his eyes and peers out at me through the heart shape created by the broken glass. Preposterous grace. Mad grace. Gracefully delivered. Oh, <laughs> oh,